Hello, welcome back. We are now moving to lecture 23 and we are going to apply all the concepts that we have developed uh, for thermodynamics to the case of photons. Um, we will learn quite a bit here, including uh, the black body radiation. And we also talk about the Einstein constant at the end of this lecture. So first of all, uh, we are going to study photons. As you know, photons uh, have been, uh, the description of photons, the physics of photons has been, has been uh, an interesting one in, in the world of, of physics. Uh, uh, initially, the idea was that light was made up of, of some particle, and then it was made up of some waves, and then finally some particles again, and those particles being photons. The idea being that light or radiation in general uh, carry a finite amount of energy uh, related to h bar omega, omega being the angular frequency of those uh, of those uh, uh, objects. So uh, we are going to see this quite a bit. Uh, the, this this here on the right hand side, uh, we are going to talk about the spectrum and see that the physics uh, depends on on where on the spectrum we we are located. We're going to see uh, other versions of this of this graph later. But the idea will be to see uh, what happens uh, for matter, matter that interacts with photons at a finite temperature. So we are basically going to look at the thermodynamics of, of, uh, of, of radiations. Now, what's interesting as well is uh, thermal radiation. So, as you know, we've discussed already due to the, the equipartition uh, theorem, any object will have energy stored in it, which is going to be one half kBT per mode of, in, of, of interaction. So, for example, three half kBT in three dimensions, that kind of thing. But what also happens is that every object at finite temperature, so a temperature that's positive, any object or any substance will emit an electromagnetic radiation. And this is, of course, related to the fact that there is an energy uh, related to, to the fact that temperature is finite. And this is exactly what we are going to study today. As you probably know, most of, of the radiation from that we know uh, in, uh, in our everyday um, experience is in the infrared regime. And it's the reason why you would use uh, infrared uh, camera or infrared goggles to see, to see uh, where the ob an object, for example, an animal, uh, the, the, the hot spot in an animal. Uh, you also know that when you increase the temperature, so if you're not at room temperature, so for example, if you take a red hot poker here, uh, if you do this, you start to see it glow. You see it red. And in fact, the, the physics uh, between seeing this uh, Pomeranian uh, uh, here on the top and seeing this, this poker, the physics is the same. Uh, it turns out that in this case, the temperature is low, therefore we have low energy radiation like infrared and when the energy is higher when the temperature is higher we start to see higher frequencies for example here in the red which start to be to be visible so that would be this is the same physics and so we are going to today what we are, what we are going to do is to really understand the quant, uh, quantity uh, not uh, just not quite just qualitatively but also quantitatively uh, what's the relationship between the temperature of an object and the frequency at, at which it's most likely to emit. So before we do that, it's important to introduce a co couple of concepts, as always. Um, and we, to, we are going to first treat everything classically. And then at some point, we will move into, into uh, statistical mechanics and uh, think about the quantum mechanical effect. But before we go there, let's let's start with with the object that we are going to use here, which is called a cavity. So a cavity is is an object of volume v. We see just a cross section here, and um, it it has it it's basically the cavity itself is is the surrounding of the system. So it's the black the the thick black line on this on this figure. And what what we what happens is that this object is in uh, thermal equilibrium with the outside, so the temperature is maintained, and the the photon can exist in there. So the the radiation exists in that object. Now we are using diathermal material so that we know that the heat the the heat can actually um, 
be be exchanged with the surrounding so that the temperature of the of the object here uh, the, the the temperature of the object is in equilibrium with the temperature of the surrounding so basically it's like a reservoir but but here for uh, radiation so this is called a cavity so the cavity is the object that includes the the um, the, the, the photon inside of them so this is the cavity here and let's we are going to try to start to to connect everything that we need to with uh, quantities that we need in thermodynamics and that we have encountered before. So first of all, imagine that you have n photons per unit volume in a cavity. Uh, we don't know what they are yet, uh, the, what S, n is and so on and so forth. This isn't, th that's not really what matters. We imagine that we have n photons. And the average energy of those photons, they can come up, they can come at different frequency, but the average energy of those photons is h bar omega. So since it's the average, that means that the total internal energy will be n times h bar omega. Okay, now here's the thing: the 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 u here is an energy density, so it's basically the total energy divided by a volume, and n here is also a density, so it's actually n divided by v, if, I, if it's clear. So the the small n that we are going to use in this in this lecture, as as we've used before, is going to be a density. Okay, so this is the density that we have. So this is the total energy. Now, what we are, what we can do is to treat this this collection of photons as a gas. So it's just behaving as a as a gas. And remember our definition of the gas that we looked at is simply a collection of objects that do not interact with each other. So this was the ideal gas. And we can uh, we could calculate um, the, the 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 energy density, uh, which was uh, the energy density being um, just the kinetic part, since we don't suppose that they interact with each other. So it's going to be mv square over two. Uh, but in this case, for 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 this particular system, we find that the pressure is going to be given by one third mv square, which is correspond to the fact that the the pressure of this system is u over 3. And so this is called the radiation pressure. This is a pressure of radiation that we that we encounter usually in an electromagnetic uh, theory uh, course. And this is directly related, the pressure is directly related to, to the internal energy through some of those partial derivatives that we, that we have encountered at the beginning uh, of this course related to the fact that the internal energy is an exact differential where we can use, for example, p uh, and and s uh, as the uh, as the natural variable. This is these are things that we've seen before. Now, in chapter seven, uh, it's described how we can calculate the flux of of photons. So it was related to also the how the gas behaves, um, and uh, in that case, the flux, so which is the number of photons that strike the walls per second per unit area. This is a flux. Uh, that flux is given by one quarter of and C, where C is the, uh, the, the, the speed of light, and N is the density of, uh, of particle, okay, the density of photons. So these are, these are, these are all results that we've seen before, uh, related to the energy density here, related to the pressure, and related to the flux. So you see that most everything on depends on u, which is which is just depend on the average frequency, and this flux depends simply on the density of of photons that we have. Very good. Now we know that the flux of photon is one quarter n c. I just described that in the previous slide, and uh, we can uh, therefore uh, in, get pretty straightforwardly the incident power. So remember power, when we talk about power, we are talking about energy per second, okay? And in this case, this is energy per second per unit area. Uh, and of course, this is proportional to the flux of photons, but we know the energy of each photon on average is h bar omega. Therefore, the incident power, so the, the amount of energy uh, per, per second, if you will, uh, and per uh, unit area is going to be obtained uh, as one quarter UC. So it's a good idea sometimes to check the, the dimensions. Uh, U is a density of energy, energy density. So it's, it's essentially joules 
per cubic meter. Uh, C, of course, is a velocity, is meter per second. So we end up with joule per square meter per second. So it's indeed the energy per second, so it's a power, per unit area, as we described. So it's a good idea sometimes to check those things so that we make sure that uh, we didn't lose any constant, for example. So that's 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 all good. So we we have we have all that. So we have the flux, we have the internal energy, we have uh, the pressure, and in fact we can already go to a very important result, which is a Stefan Stefan Boltzmann Boltzmann law. And the question that the Stefan Boltzmann law answers is: What is the energy flux radiating from a body at temperature T? So we already we've already done in the previous slide what's the what's the flux of energy uh, incident um, on in, in this cavity that we discussed before. But the question is what is the energy flux radiating uh, from a body that has temperature T? Okay. So while we're going to use what we know, and what what we know here is of course the first law of thermodynamics, T U equal T D S minus P D V. Uh, I think that we have probably repeated this equation close to 50 times already in this course. And this, the advantage of this, because it's an exact differential, is that I can directly calculate the derivative of the internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature. And you obtain uh, directly this, this equation here, uh, obtain directly from here. Now, you also remember Maxwell uh, relation, and if you don't, at least you, re you remember they exist. Therefore, you go, go back to the, to the list of them, the, the Maxwell relation, to find what is the derivative of the entropy with respect to volume at constant temperature. And what you find in this particular Maxwell relation is that this term here is nothing else than dp over dt at constant volume. Okay? So, um, this is this is what we, we we can do in this case. So that that's nice. Why why is it nice? Well, it's nice because uh, actually I know the pressure. Remember, the pressure was nothing else than one third of of u of the uh, energy density uh, for a gas. That's what we've done. So we also know this. We know the pressure. It's one third of of u. Again, because we treat this as a gas of photons. So that's that's nice. Uh, we can transform this by replacing p by one third of u. On both uh, on, on both things, and we have, and we have this. So what's what start to be interesting now is that we have the change in the internal energy, as of uh, with respect to temperature, on the right hand side. So this is really re very close to what we are interested in about the change in energy, and the change in temperature. So we start to to be close to answering this question here. So before we move on, let's try to take what see what happens on the left hand side. So how does the total energy changes when we change volume? Okay, well, you could probably have an idea what this is. How the total energy changes when you change volume is probably related to, an, to the energy density. Well, let's, let's just do it. So the left-hand side, so we know that the total energy is the energy density times the volume by definition. Therefore, the derivative of on the left and right here is going to be simply equal to, to this. To this, it's a derivative of a product, so it's just going to be the chain rule. Uh, by definition, the density u, the energy density, is is a is a is a constant. It's an intensive variable in the sense that it does not depend on the volume. Okay, by definition, it does not depend by the on the volume. Therefore, this term is zero, and we see that this derivative of u with respect to volume is indeed the energy density. It's not, it's not a big, big uh, shock, is it? So that means the left-hand side here is u. So let's go back to the next slide. And in the next slide, I will repeat this equation with the right value u on the left-hand side. And this is what I, what I just mentioned uh, as, as advertised. Uh, we can reorder this to put all the u's on one side and this on the other side. And when we can keep manipulating this, now the, the partial derivative becomes a straight derivative because we only have those, those two, uh, those two cons on the left and the right, t and u. So we would clearly see that we have the variations. And so, of course, you recognize that these two, these two equations can be 
Uh, this equation can be both integrated on the left and the right. We're going to have the logarithm of t to the power 4 here and the logarithm of u here. So if the two logarithms are the same, that means that the two, um, the two arguments are the same. Uh, of course, when I integrate, I also have a constant, an additional constant that I, that I cannot uh, describe by integrating. So in other words, I find that u is equal to t uh, to a t4. Uh, you can convince yourself that this is the case by re-putting AT4 in here. So you get 4 uh, AT, and of course, this is what you get because you have a constant. So this is this all works very well. Okay. So we find that the, inter the energy density in, in, in a thermodynamic object, in an object like this treated within thermodynamics, is a constant A times T to the power 4. So basically, when you when you double the temperature, you multiply the internal energy by a power by a factor 16. And this is what you obtain at the end. And this is the important result is that the flux, the energy flux, as we discussed, which was one quarter of UC. So I introduced this about three slides ago. Now I can replace U by the value depends on the temperature. And I end up with something that just proportional to sigma T4. Okay. Sigma, it's a new constant, which is called the Stefan uh, Boltzmann. So the Stefan Boltzmann constant is one quarter of this A here. The point remains that the energy that's transferred, the, so the, the incident power per unit area, uh, so the energy per second per unit area is given by this, by this formula. And this is, uh, this is repeated on this slide, uh, and where uh, this incident power per unit area is sometimes called the energy flux, the radiative flux, or the irradiance. So the irradiance is, is something that, that exists, uh, that is used quite a bit as well. So we can, we can keep moving with this, uh, and this is what we are going to do now. Uh, so repeat, remember this, this, uh, this constant here. So this is all good, you know, the, the power uh, that's, that's coming uh, per unit area. Uh, that's fine. You see that it's proportional to the the speed velocity, and not a big, not a big surprise since since the electromagnetic waves go, uh, travel at, this, at the velocity of light. Uh, and also, uh, we just saw that it was proportional to U, the internal energy, which itself uh, was related to to two to, to t to the power four. Okay, very good. The thing about, however, is that we do not no longer have information. On, uh, on 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 what uh, uh, what frequencies how how what is the contribution for each from each frequency of the spectrum? So we call about we talk about energy density of the electromagnetic radiations, and so how many joules are stored in a cubic meter of cavity? So this is what we see here. Uh, U the U is how many joules are stored per in a cubic meter of cavity. But what we would really be interested in is a spectral energy density. A spectral usually means part of the spectrum, how, so a frequency-dependent energy density. So how, do we store more energy at different frequency? Basically, this is the idea. And so to convince yourself of the answer to that, uh, we use a, a, a thought experiment. So you suppose that you have two cavities like this in here, and both of them are imposed to stay at the same temperature T. So there are, there are those cavities. So there is electromagnetic radiation here, electromagnetic radiation there. And uh, we connect them. So they can actually exchange, uh, they can exchange uh, radiation possibly, but they certainly cannot exchange heat since the two systems have the same temperature. Remember the first, uh, the, remember the second law of thermodynamics. So one cavity here is covered with soot. So like, like a, just burn coal, for example, or whatever. And here, this one is actually lined with a mirror, so it can reflect everything. So the question is, uh, the first question we can answer is that, uh, what's the frequency range of the storage on this kind of object? So if the temperature is the same on both sides, as we discussed from the second law of thermodynamics, there is no heat exchange between the two, right? So we have the same flux F on the left and on the right. If, they were, if the flux from this cavity and this, the flux from this cavity were different, there will be an exchange of heat between the two. But we know 
that they cannot be because of the due to the thermodynamics, the, the fact that the two temperatures are the same, we are in equilibrium. So whatever heat comes this way has to come that way as well. So that's nice. That's nice because that means that both cavities, therefore, since there is no difference in flux on both, both sides, both cavities must have the same U, right? If F on the left and F on the right are the same, since C is a constant, U has to be the same on the left and on the right. So basically what it shows is that the energy density, so the energy per volume, is the same regardless of what the cavity is made up of. It makes no difference because we're in equilibrium. So that's important. So, and this is due to the fact that the flux only depends on the density. It does not depend on a material property. There's no property of the material in this equation here. So, in other words, that means that the internal energy density is independent on shape. We could have choose, chosen a different shape on the left and the right. On size, the size never showed up. What matters is the density and the material of the cavity. It does not depend on any of that, okay? Now, this is important. That means that the internal energy uh, uh, density, due to the spectral energy density, is uh, independent of material and, and shape, but it's a fairly weak argument because we don't know anything about the wavelength, okay? So we don't know maybe Maybe the, the some wavelength, the, uh, the 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 flux of different wavelengths is different on both sides, um, simply because uh, uh, so long as the total energy density is the same, it's good. But so we have not been able to fix it. But it's, it's actually pretty easy to prove that it's that that conclusion is also true for uh, each wavelength, so that the internal uh, energy density for each wavelength is the same on both sides. It's actually you can prove it this way. So you use the same the same apparatus here, but you allow a filter, a spectral filter to be placed here. So that filter is going to stop, is not, is going to stop, for example, any frequency you want and let only some frequency go. Okay. And clearly imagine that you can only let the very narrow frequency of red to go through here. So you put a filter at A. Well, if you do that again, there is no net flux going left to the right since we have temperature that are the same on both sides. So in other words, the energy density at that particular wavelength is the same on both sides. And you can repeat this experiment for any frequency and any filter. So that means that uh, the energy density at a given wavelength is the same on both sides for any wavelength, so long as the temperature on both sides are uh, maintained at the same value. Now, we have introduced on this slide this notation u lambda. And u lambda times d lambda is the energy density due to the photons which have wavelengths between lambda and lambda plus d lambda. Um, so that's 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 the idea that we that we have here. So we have introduced u lambda d lambda, which is the energy density for wavelengths between lambda and uh, between uh, d lambda sorry, between lambda and lambda plus d lambda. Uh, we do this, we have to do this because we imagine that these functions are, uh, these are, they are continuous function. So we need, to, we need to use those infinitesimal uh, interval as we did before. So the big conclusion here is a spectral internal energy. So when we say spectral, that means that we, we have a resolution on the wavelengths or the frequency. Uh, there's has no dependence on the materials, shape, size, or nature of the cavity is thus a universal function of t, n, and lambda. Okay, so those functions do not depend on the material; they only depend on uh, the temperature and the wavelength. So that's that's a big deal, and we are going to we are going to of course find what it is. But it's also a big, already a big deal that these quantity are universal, and we are going to see the, the important consequences on this because uh, it makes observation of, for example, of spectral energy density uh, very interesting because it gives you information on, on, on essentially uh, the, the, the temperature distribution and, and how the temperature change, for example, with time. We are going to see that in a few minutes. But before we go there, 
let's try let's try to to think a little bit about about another thing, which is Kirchhoff's law. And the Kirchhoff's law is going to bring us a bit closer to to where we want to be uh, before we move to the statistical mechanics distribution of everything. So the first question you can ask yourself is that now that you know what's the internal energy in a cavity, and then we know it's the U is universal, uh, the, it only depends on temperature, and, uh, and the U lambda, which is, which is the resolution on wavelengths, only depends on temperature and the wavelength itself, not on the material. Now the question we can ask ourselves is, how well does a particle surface absorb or emit electromagnetic radiation for a given wavelength or a given frequency. And for that, we are going to introduce yet uh, another a couple of other definitions, which we will call the spectral absorptivity lambda, uh, alpha of lambda, which is just a fraction of the incident radiation that's absorbed at wavelengths lambda. So that's a dimensionless number. It just tells you what is the proportion of the incident radiation that gets absorbed, okay? so. Just so you know, if, if uh, A lambda is equal to 1, that means that everything is absorbed. Therefore, nothing is reflected, and the object looks uh, uh, black. Okay. Now, if it doesn't absorb anything, if, uh, if the system does not absorb anything, that means everything is reflected back, and, and, and therefore the system does not look black at all. Then we also have the spectral emissive power. Uh, which is the power emitted per unit area by the electromagnetic radiation uh, at wavelengths lambda and lambda plus d lambda. So the, the emissive power is how much energy is emitted on, uh, by the electromagnetic radiation of, from, by an object. Okay? So we, we, have, we basically have all we need now because we, we, are just, we just look at three things. The first one that we looked at at some length was a spectral energy density, which is related to the energy that's stored into the cavity. Then we also have the energy here that uh, this is the this is the power absorbed by the system. So remember this between the parentheses was the power uh, per it's the power per unit area that was the incident on the system. So of course. Only a, a portion alpha of lambda of this is absorbed. By the, this is the definition of alpha of lambda. And of course, we also have the power per unit area emitted, which is simply related to the emissive power, as we described in this uh, green box where we provided two definitions. Of course, at equilibrium, uh, whatever is absorbed and whatever is uh, emitted has to be the same and that means simply that because of this we end up with this at equilibrium the ratio between uh MSC, the 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 emissivity the emissive power and the absorptivity has to be equal to u lambda c over four and this is of course an important result as well uh because as you know u lambda was uh uh, did not depend on the material in particular, okay? U lambda is a universal uh, quantity that only depends on lambda and on the temperature. We just discussed this for the Kirchhoff's law, I mean, before the Kirchhoff's law. And this is important. Uh, let's try to think about this. So this is the result we have. The right-hand side does not depend on the material at all. It only depends on temperature and on the wavelength. So that means that a good emitter is one that has a large E and a good uh, um, a good absorber as one that has a good lambda uh, uh, alpha. So what this means is that this ratio here does not depend on the material properties. It only depends on on temperature and wavelength. So in other words, since this is constant regardless of the material you look at, if E is very large, so you have very good emitters. Alpha has to be very large as well, because this ratio is a constant. On the other hand, if you have a poor emitter, if E is very small, then alpha has to be very small as well to maintain this ratio constant. In other words, 
And this is, a, this is an important, very important result that we know, at least we know from, from our daily experience. A good absorber is also a good emitter. But likewise, a bad absorber is a bad emitter. And this is all coming from the fact that the right-hand side of this equation is a universal constant, a universal property that only depends on temperature and wavelength. So that's, a, that's an important thing. So you, you, you have to be careful, though, uh, to go too far with this, too, too far with this equation. Uh, when we say a good absorber is a good emitter, it means that at a given wavelength, so if you have an object that, that looks black to you, well, you can say if it's black, that means that it has a good absorber of light. Therefore, uh, it's a good emitter of light. Okay? That's okay. But that doesn't mean that it's on, that doesn't mean that it's going to be a good absorber in general. It's only a good absorber and a good emitter at the visible wave light. It might be pretty poor with infrared, for example. It might be pretty poor with UVs or any other uh, wavelengths that are not visible. So uh, this property is wavelength dependent. But for given wavelengths, a good absorber at a given wavelength is a good emitter as a, as a, at that same wavelength. And this is true if they were bad as well. Good. So we are making good progress here. Let's try to let's try to move uh, one step uh, one step further. Let's let's try to define now what we call the perfect black body, uh, and this is because the black body radiation is one of the crucial uh, concepts that we use in physics. And essentially, the definition of a perfect black body is pretty straightforward: is one that's a perfect absorber at all wavelengths. So it's basically a material for which the absorptivity here is one. So everything that hits the surface of that object that's made up of that material is going to be absorbed. And if it's we we and the name black body comes from the fact that indeed uh, something that looks black means that it's absorbing all the wavelengths in the uh, all the wavelengths in the visitor, visible range. It's what we are used to. But here that definition goes beyond the visible range. The black body is the body that absorbs every single wavelength perfectly, okay? So that means that it's also uh, the best emitter, okay? It doesn't mean that it emits perfectly, of course. It simply means, means that the, the value of E, so the emissive power, has to be the largest possible so that we maintain the ratio of E divided by alpha. And so now, you, we introduced the notion, the concept of cavity uh, a few minutes ago, and then we can consider creating a cavity with the walls made up of black body. So all the radiation that hits the wall are going to be absorbed, uh, and the walls are going to be the perfect, uh, the, the 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 optimal emitters as well. Not necessarily the not necessarily the best, uh, I mean the best emitter, but that doesn't mean they are going to emit everything. It just means that we have the best emitter, okay? So imagine now that you have, uh, you are making this cavity. I remember that you have, you, you, you do have the presence of radiation in that, in that system since, uh, since the wall at a given temperature do uh, emit uh, radiation. Uh, and, and there is an, an internal, uh, there is an energy density U of lambda at a given, a given wavelength due to the temperature, right? That's what we've discussed so far. Uh, so that means that that cavity is going to contain photons, for sure, and of, of uh, energy density U. And uh, those particular photons, because they are in a black, bot a black bo uh, cavity made up of a black body material, uh, th they are going to create what's called a black body radiation. So the black body radiation, if you will, uh, is just that radiation that exists into a cavity that has a that, that, for which the walls are made of out of black uh, body material. So each time uh, a radiation hits the wall is is absorbed perfectly. It's why the alpha equal to one means. But also those walls are going to emit the best. Okay. So we are going to see what what exactly it it, it corresponds to. And uh, we are going to, to understand uh, a lot of physics thanks to this. 
But before we move to that, before we try to move to move too far with this, let, let's try to do one particular uh, application of this, a, a well-known application um, that we can already apply. So, you know, in physics, very often we, we come up with the perfect situation and uh, on an idealized per situation, and we see how far we can take it and, and how much we can understand about the physical or natural phenomenon by using this, this simplified uh, description. The reason why we want a simplified description is first, first of all, because we can actually carry it out. But there is, some, there is another reason, is that the simplest your model, the fewer, uh, the, the, the fewer the constraint, if you will, or at least the best you understand the, the constraint. That means that if you are able to understand a phenomena, it's much easier to pinpoint the uh, fundamental origin of that phenomena. So let's try to see if the black body radiation is, is actually a, a crazy idea or not. And we are going to see in, in the rest of this lecture, it's not a crazy idea at all. And in fact, it applies very, very bro uh, broadly. Uh, I would even say universally, but we are going to see what I mean by that in, in a few minutes. So let's let's consider the sun and and the earth. Of course, they are not they are not drawn to scale on this on this uh, figure, um, and we are going to we are going to to be kind of crazy here. We are going to suppose that both of those objects are going to to be treated as black bodies. Okay, and this is usually where students are a little bit confused. They say, how can you consider that the sun is a black body? I mean, it 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 looks like everything but a black body. Well. Remember that he's, he has is emitting uh, is the perfect emitter. It also means that he can absorb uh, perfectly every radiation that comes its way, and uh, that's that's what it means. So do not get fooled by the fact we say it's black body. It does. It's it's uh, it means that he absorbed and emit uh, uh, the best basically. And we are going to suppose that the Earth is also a, a black body. So let's try to see if we can understand something from this. So uh, we are going to introduce another definition, which is called the lum uh, luminosity, which we are going to call it the power per surface area that we can use from uh, Stefan Boltzmann. So as you know, the power per surface area, so the power, the energy that's actually the flux, if you will, uh, that's, that's uh, the, the, the amount of energy per second per surface area. Remember, we descri described this as sigma t to the power four, temperature to the power four. Uh, so this is an energy per unit area per second. Uh, so the total energy per second is going to be the energy per unit area per second times the area, right? And of course, the external surface of, of a sphere is 4 pi times the square of the radius. So in other words, this term here, when we I multiply the surface of the sphere times the power per unit area, that means that this luminosity is a power, okay? So it's an it's a energy per second, okay? So this is what the sun basically uh, emit uh, per second. And we're going to suppose that this thing is D. Now, here's what happens. Imagine the radiation is radiating away from the sun and it's going to reach the surface of the earth. And we know that the energy per second that's going to come from the sun is this. Now, of course, as you know, the energy, if you imagine the energy is actually tra uh, uh, traveling isot uh, in an isotropic uh, 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 so the same way at every angle in three dimension, only a small portion of this energy is going to hit the Earth. In fact, the, 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 uh, you can say that the surface that it's going to hit here is just going to be kind of a cross-section of the Earth which would be like um, uh, pi r square, basically, right? Uh, pi r square of the Earth. So pi r square will simply be like kind of a cross section here of the of the Earth. That's what's going to hit uh, the sun. Uh, it uh, what the, the the light from the sun is going to hit. Now, uh, what's the so this is only the surface area that's going to be touched by by the energy from the sun. So. The, the, the ratio of that energy will be the total surface area at this distance d divided, or actually the other way around, this surface area divided by the total surface area 
of that sphere at distance d, right? Only this portion is going to get to hit the, the Earth. So we are looking at the how much energy comes to the Earth from the sun. So that's going to be the ratio between the surface of this six, small section divided by the entire surface of the sphere at distance d, so 4 pi d square. So this is the incident power, so the energy per second. So this here as is unitless. It just gives you the ratio of energy that hits here compared to the entire energy that came from the sun at distance d. Now, you also have a, an emitted a power emitted by the Earth, right? So the Earth is going to behave just like a Stefan Boltzmann uh, body, which is so uh, sigma t to the power 4 times the surface area. So sig sigma t to the power 4 is an energy per second per surface area. So of course, the surface area of the Earth is 4 pi r squared. So the entire surface, so this is what's emitted. And we know, we expect that if we are in equilibrium, if, if we as much comes in as comes out, those two terms should be equal, should be equal. So at equilibrium, they should be equal. And when you simplify, it's actually pretty straightforward. You find that temperature of the Earth divided by temperature of the sun is simply given by the square root of the radius of the sun divided by, by two times the distance between the two. This is a very simple equation that comes from the uh, black body radiation that we've looked at, Stefan Boltzmann equation right there, which, which of course means that the, we consider the alpha equal to one. That's basically what we had, we've done. Of course, we can put in the, some numbers using the radius of the sun, the distance from between Earth and sun. Uh, and then you find that if, uh, if you imagine the temperature of the sun is 5,800 Kelvin, you find temperature of the Earth is 280, which is a little bit uh, lower than what it actually is. But it's actually not bad at all because we have done a very simple uh, assumption. So we find that indeed the temperature of the Earth follows the prediction from the black body radiation. So we can conclude that uh, the sun and the earth do behave essentially like black bodies. And uh, that is how we get the, we find that the, the value for the energy work out. So let's try to, let's try to, to take a pause here for a minute. Uh, and remember uh, what we've done so far. And what we've done so far is uh, for the black body radiation. So we have a we have a cavity, a three-dimensional cavity, and we found the energy in that cavity. Uh, and we found that energy did not depend on the material that we had in it, but it only depend on uh, the temperature. Um, uh, it only depend on the temperature, really. Uh, so the spectral uh, energy density depending on temperature and the wavelength, but not the material either. Now we could calculate the power uh, radiated per unit area, which was sigma T4. And uh, the energy density, which which was related to this, but divided by by uh, uh, which is actually related to this equation, u as a function of temperature. So we obtain this this result. And finally, the pressure on the wall, which is u over three, which are which are result that we obtained from thermodynamics when we compare the pressure when we could related the pressure with the internal energy for the for the for the ideal gas for the gas, and we we obtain those results. So that's very nice. So this is if you have a radiation into a, inside the box like this. Now, the question you can ask yourself is that usually light comes in the shape of a beam. So what, what do we need to, to change in this description uh, if we suppose that the electromagnetic wave uh, moves as a beam? So in order to, do, to look at the beam of light, we can, we can consider a collimated beam of light. That's really what it means. It's, it's, it's a pretty uh, narrow beam of light. And uh, we can consider it's the momentum, which is uh, n h bar, bar k, uh, uh, n being the density, of, of course, of, 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 a, of a photon, and h bar k being the momentum. And so we can replace k by uh, the frequency, the angular frequency divided by c, by, by uh, this dispersion relationship between uh, in light. And of course, this momentum is absorbed by unit area of surface, which is normal to the beam. And the time it takes is, is uh, for each meter, if you will, is 1 over c, where c is the speed of, of light. And of course, this is related to, uh, to the pressure, right? So the pressure 
is going to be related by um, by the time it takes. So by by by, uh, by 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 the pressure, by the impulse that you obtain per second. So basically, uh, that, that you calculate per second. So basically, the pressure is going to be NH bar uh, omega divided by C divided by the time it takes to, to, to for it to to be transferred. So one over C, and you end up with the pressure is equal to NH bar omega, which is equal to U. So this U is different from what we had for the for the non-collimated uh, beam of light, uh, but we also found that the pressure was proportional to U. It was just there was just a factor three in what we did before. Before collimated uh, beam of light, we, uh, we in other words that we can describe K in one dimension, we obtain this result here that the pressure is actually equal to the internal uh, energy uh, density. Density, it's important to remember that it's density. We also can calculate the power per unit area, which is simply the amount of energy that hits a surface per second. So again, we look at the total energy uh, density, NH bar omega, and we divide that by the time, by, 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 the, by the time it takes to travel one meter, and we obtain, uh, we divide by one over C, which means that the power per unit area uh, so the energy per second per unit area is U times C. And uh, and we can uh, obtain all this, and we can calculate, of course, the energy density of radiation that we had before. And we obtain results that are slightly different from the one we had when we have uh, when we do not have the constraint on the fact that it's a beam of light. So this is very important to, to remember this because, of course, the results are slightly different. There are different prefactors. And... Uh, when you actually try to do calculations, you have to make sure that you use the right formula uh, for, for these problems. But of course, the functional uh, uh, dependencies are, are very similar between the two cases. Uh, just to give you an idea, the pressure of radiation is, is, the, is the, the power divided by C. Uh, if we look at the power from the sunlight, which for the sun, the, from the light coming from the sun on Earth is 1370 uh, watt per square meter. And you can calculate the pressure and you'll find that the pressure is 4.6 micropascal. Uh, so that's a way, way, way smaller, many orders of magnitude smaller than the atmospheric pressure. So it is tiny, but it's real. Uh, it, 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 does, it does exist uh as as an actual pressure of radiation and it's simply due to the fact that that photons have a momentum transfer when they hit the surface and so this is this is definitely a small effect but it's it's a true effect i think now it's time to to move on to to the next uh, uh to the next treatment so right now we have used a treatment that we've used uh we've developed early in this course uh, using the internal energy mostly as the central variable that we were interested in and from which we could get the pressure and the, and the flux and, and irradiance and all those uh, properties that we could obtain from thermodynamics. Now I think it's time to move to the, to the next stage and uh, provide a statistical mechanics treatment of the problem that we have. Uh, and then th this, is, this is what we are going to do for the rest of uh, this lecture today. So first of all, uh, we are the, the big big leap that we are going to make here is that because uh, radiation is described by the frequency omega, we are going to suppose that and actually an angular frequency omega, we are going to suppose that we can describe light or each photon, if you will, uh, or a magnetic wave, we can describe it as a harmonic oscillator, like basically an oscillating object, which is of course. Uh, which kind of makes sense for an electromagnetic wave. So uh, this is not completely justified. This is something that you can justify in a, in a more advanced quantum mechanics course. But we are going to suppose that we can describe the electromagnetic wave by a simple harmonic oscillator. Of course, you know why we do this. It's because a simple harmonic oscillator, we, we know a lot of information from them, like the partition function, the energy spectrum, and all those things. So uh, we know that the momentum for each mode is k, and the angular angular uh, frequency is c dot k and c times k. So uh, in physics, uh, so solid state physics, uh, optics, and so on and so forth, when we have a relationship that 
that uh, um, that relate that uh, an angular frequency with the momentum, we call that as dispersion relation. So usually we plot uh, the frequency, the angular frequency omega as a function of the momentum. And of course, in this case, it's a fairly straightforward plot because it's a straight line. And in fact, the the slope of this line is the speed of light. Okay. So, uh, so this is called a dispersion relation that that links uh, the momentum and the frequency. Okay. So now we we know that we have those harmonic oscillators that exist in a cubic cavity of size l, let's suppose. And of course, what we uh, what we want to do, we want to calculate the partition function of this. As you remember, uh, when we look at the gas. And I invite you to go back in 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 probably chapter twenty one when we introduce the partition function of of a gas. Uh, we came we had to come up with a density of state simply because the states were so close to one another uh, because uh, they exist in a cavity of size l and l being a macroscopic number, uh, macroscopic value, right? It's one meter, for example. Uh, that means that uh, you have a very very large density. Of, of of different states um, and they are very close to one another. Therefore, we have to call a density of state. We have to introduce density of state. And and we found that the the size, uh, the, the the space that each uh, state has to occupy in that box, uh, quantum mechanically, was equal to two pi over l uh, cube. So it's a cube of size two pi over l. So what we did, and this is maybe for maybe you remember how we got this equation, and I invite you to go back if you don't remember. Uh, this equation should be read like this. On the left hand side, we have the number of states that are between k and k plus dk. Now, if you consider a sphere where the, the three-dimensional k exists, the surface of a sphere is 4 pi k square. And the volume of a shell of thickness dk is 4 pi k squared dk. That means that the number of states that you can put in that shell is the volume divided by the volume of each individual state. But each individual state's volume is 2 pi over L cube because we need to obey the constraint due to uh, quantum mechanics in a box. Uh, so that's that's the density of state. It's the number of states between k and k plus dk. And, and you need to, to, to picture that when we say between k and k plus dk, think about the sphere that we looked in this k space, and think about the shell, the little the shell of thickness dk in in that space. Now there is a factor of two there on the right hand side. The factor factor of two comes from the fact that light can come polarized uh, uh, in two ways, uh, left-handed, right-handed, and each can occupy the same the same state in in uh, in. Uh, in case space, so we have a factor of two there. Good. Now we can rewrite this, of course, uh, by remembering that the volume is L cube, uh, and then by by simplifying a little bit the pi and so on and so forth. So no 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 real big deal. And of course we had one uh, eight in the numerator, uh, eight in the numerator, and eight in the denominator. So we can simplify them. But we get the density of state, the density of state of photons. So how many photons you have per uh, at between k and k plus dk, uh, when they are forced to see a cavity of volume v, and this is this is the answer here. It's going to be very useful. So this is k is momentum, and as you know, you can if you can f k, you can relate that to to the frequency. So since there is a clear one to one one to one correspondence between k and, and omega through the dispersion relation, so this is what we'll do on this slide. So on this slide, we have the number of states between k and k plus dk. And we would like to know gw. So, so that gw dw is the number of states at angular frequency omega, between angular frequency omega and angular frequency omega plus d omega. So how you, ch this is basically a change of variable. So you're interested in gw dw. And for that, you just remember uh, fairly f um, elementary calculus. gw is gk dk over dw, right? Because um, we can we can certainly write this. And dk over dw is 1 over c. Remember, it's this person relationship. So we can write simply write, uh, write uh, this pretty straightforwardly. 
and obtain and obtain this result right here for the for the density of state, uh, but in the frequency space. We are almost there. Why do we want to do the frequency space? Well, because we know the energy as a function of, of uh, omega. We know the energy of a, of a specific photon of frequency, uh, um, angular frequency omega is h bar omega. This is, this is a quantum mechanical result. So now the internal energy can be calculated this way. And then please uh, uh, stick with me here because this is an important result and you have to bring back other stuff, other, other results from other sections that we've studied so far. The internal energy is expectation value of uh, the energy, okay? And so what we, what, we, what we need to do is the density of state, okay? So how many states I have at given frequency uh, between that frequency and frequency plus, d, uh, frequency plus d omega times the energy, okay? Times this factor here, which is related to what we've done when we studied partition function of a harmonic oscillator. And actually we are going to go right there. So if we look here, we found that the internal energy for the harmonic oscillator is given by this value. So not just h bar omega. So h bar omega is a distance between the, 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 the levels, but also multiplied by this. And by multiplying by this, we already took into account the fact that we are at finite temperature. So let's go back here. So just, just to, to recap, the internal energy will be the energy of each harmonic oscillator. So not just h bar omega, but h bar omega times this term here that comes from the fact that we are working at finite temperature times the number of states that we have at that frequency, which is g omega, d omega. And of course, we have to sum over all the possible states. This is how you get the internal energy of a collection of harmonic oscillators that are forced to stay in a box of volume V, okay? And the forcing of being in the volume V is included in the density of state and the fact that the harmonic oscillators at equilibrium with temperature T is obtained from this result that we obtained for single harmonic oscillator. Very nice. This is a very important result right here. It's actually a very, it's actually a central result. Now here is one thing, and I like the way that it's described in the book. Um, we have two terms here. So we have the one half the integral, and then we have the other half. And I'm going to explain to you so how the book does it. So you have a first term, which is the one half. If you do this integral, and you remember we have this expression for GW, uh, G of omega in a couple of slides ago. You are going to see it goes to infinity. And so here you're going to pinch your nose or well, maybe uh, try to do something while you do this. <laughs> you're going to suppose that this is the energy of vacuum. This is going to be, you're going to consider this as the reference of energy. Therefore, you're going to suppose that you can shift all the energy so that this term can be neglected. Now, the part you have to pinch your nose is that you are neglecting something that goes to infinity. So it's a little bit hard to swallow, but we, at this point, we are going to accept this as a result that we need to, we can drop this term as being the constant that we can, that does not depend on temperature here. So we can, we can take, get rid of it. So the second term that I've left is right here. So this is the second term that I have. So dropping the one half. So we suppose this one is, is going to be neglected. We are going to, Neglect it, even though it goes to infinity. But let's let's move on from there. Uh, we can we can calculate this, and we in fact because of the of g the of omega, which depend on the omega square, we can um, we can obtain obtain this equation. And this is another integral that that's actually believe it or not, it's actually a known integral if you look at in the in tables of integral. And uh, you you obtain this result, and in fact the equation that you need to use is this one. So this is again uh, available on tables uh, of integrals and in uh, Wolfram or other other tables online. But what you obtain is that the internal energy now that you obtain uh, is indeed uh, dependent on t to the power four, just like the Stefan Boltzmann equation that we saw before. But what in 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 a very important departure from what we did from a purely thermodynamic description of the effect. 
uh, where we had uh, the, the constant A that we introduced because we had to integrate an equ two equations. Now we know exactly what the constant A is. The constant A is obtained from uh, this particular term in front. So we find that this term here is what we obtain from the factor A. By the way, the volume does not show because the equation we had for the Stefan Boltzmann equation was for the energy density. So it was for small u. So v goes actually to the left, right? u, uh, uppercase u divided by v is, is lowercase u. So we have we are left with this, which is which is the constant A. And the constant A only depends on constant. Uh, so pi, kV, C, H bar. So that again shows that the internal energy only depends on the temperature and fundamental constant, does not depend on the material that we were looking at. So if you remember that the constant A is four sigma over C, this was there when we connected the power uh, uh, density with uh, the energy density, uh, we obtained the, the constant of Stefan Boltzmann, and it's a constant, you can calculate it, and you obtain this number here. 567, 10 to the power minus eight, what, what per square meter per Kelvin to the power four. So this is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, uh, which only depends on fundamental constant of nature. So you can obtain it from other fundamental constant of nature. The H bar that's here reminds you that there is a quantum mechanical effect and you know there is a quantum, mechani quantum mechanical effect. This is where we said that the energy is quantized with H bar omega, but also, when we calculated the density of state, where each state could only take a volume in a cube of size two pi over L uh, in, in the space of, of momentum. So that's very nice. Now we can keep moving a little with this and we can actually apply this equation, uh, of course, where we, where we, get, rid of, we get rid of this one half, as I said, because we, we say it's a reference for the energy. So, What's nice about this, if you remove the one half, is that you see that the energy, the total energy here, is uh, is directly can is directly written as a function of frequencies. So that means that we can directly write the internal energy density as the integral here uh, as a function of frequency. Well, why is that important? Well, because this u of of omega is going to be the spectral energy density. So it's just not the energy density, but also the energy density for given frequency. There's something that we could not do before, but now we, we do it. And, and this, is, this is the crucial result for today's lecture. Uh, the crucial result is here, and we obtain it right away because we can directly compare this equation or the equation that we did before uh, in the previous slide where we spelled out the value of GW. We can introduce it, it here and, and, and compare to this. And we obtain that the... Uh, Energy, the spectral energy density, so energy density for given angular uh, frequency, that energy is related to this distribution right here, and it's called the black body distribution. This is this is the internal energy that we have um, in a cavity made up of black body uh, walls, if you will. Now, of course, you can you can use different uh, you can use other variable instead of, of the angular frequency you can use a simple just the frequency where you don't have the two pi anymore uh you can you can do that of course this is, this is a very straightforward thing to do uh you have nu instead of omega so omega is two pi nu right it's, it's just the frequency the other one is related to uh the frequency to go around the circle right uh you can also uh because you know the frequency and um the, the wavelength are, are related. I mean, they are connected to one another uh, using uh, the speed of light, right? The frequency, basically the frequency is the rate at which light goes to uh, go over a distance lambda. That's basically what it means. So you can actually replace all those variables uh, by considering that the density of the, the energy, the amount of energy here between uh, nu and nu plus d nu is the same as the energy between lambda and lambda plus d lambda. That is the idea here. And that allows you to do a change of variable between u and, and lambda, and you obtain this equation, okay? So these are important equations. These are equations that tell you how much energy there is uh, in a cavity that's maintained at temperature t. And remember, the t is actually hidden somewhere in the beta, one over kbt, for a given wavelength. 
All right. Now you could say, well, one over lambda five, it means that the AK is, it goes down very quickly. Well, watch out because there is also an exponential here. So when lambda gets very, very large, uh, these things also change a lot. Okay, so this becomes very, very small. So there is competition. So when there is competition like this between a, a fast decaying and, and one that does not decay at all, it actually increases, um, yeah, as a function of lambda, you usually find a maximum somewhere, something that goes uh, down and something that goes up, you usually get uh, at least a, a maximum somewhere. And in fact, when we plot these, these curves, that's what we obtain. And this is an example that I've taken up directly from the book where we uh, uh, plot uh, the, the, different, uh, the different value that we have at different temperature uh, as a function either of, uh, of frequency or as a function of wavelength. Um, so of course, the larger the frequency, the smaller the wavelength, okay? So that means that you have to go a much smaller wavelength to get a high frequency, right? That's the idea. Now, this kind of plot, and it's maybe a good idea to spend a couple of seconds on this. Uh, Hertz, as you know, this is the, the unit for frequency. The spectroscopists usually use uh, inverse wave number per centimeter. So that's usually wave numbers. We can we say uh, CM minus one. And of course, you can use that unit because the relationship between um, wave number and, and frequency is, is a constant, and that constant is the speed of light, of course. So that's important. Now, what's interesting is that you have, as expected, uh, increase and then a decrease. So there is, in each case, um, and by the way, we are just looking at the same result shown with a different uh, variable, but the two variables are, are, are related one, on one to one. But what's important to know is that depending on the temperature that you use, and it's a parameter here, you see that the shift, that the higher the temperature, the higher the frequencies at, uh, at which the maximum happens, right? We are going to see that in a second in more details. And uh, uh, more, more importantly, we, we see that some frequency do not, uh, they, there's no, basically no uh, internal energy at some very high frequency. And we are going to understand that going to understand in a few seconds why when we when we look into uh, a little bit deeper into the quantum mechanics of this uh okay very good so let's let's keep let's keep doing but before we do i like to show this plot it's one, one of my favorite plots uh in uh, in yellow this is uh is experimental data uh it's coming from this from this website uh this is experimental data for the sun and this is uh in gray, this is the black body spectrum. So basically, we already saw that the sun behaves very much like a black body. We understood that before with another example. But you can see that even, even more clearly. And you see that most of the light coming from, the maximum of the light coming from the sun is in the visible. Uh, there's some UVs as well, and also some infrared. So another thing that's important, and as physicists, uh, you, you understand this, is that if you look at the radiation closer to the sea level, so this is after the sunlight went through the atmosphere, you can see that there are, there are places when there is no uh, energy that hits the, the, the ground. And in fact, the reason why it doesn't hit the ground is because that energy has been absorbed by exciting water molecule, carbon monoxide, as you know, uh, and uh, maybe even ozone here that's on, on the left-hand side, oxygen. So all those peaks are basically showing what is present in the atmosphere and what has been excited, so basically where the energy went before it could had had a chance to hit uh, the ground. So if you go above the atmosphere before you see all those molecules, the spectrum from the, from, uh, the sun is indeed like a black body radiation and not so much when it hits the, 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 the earth because of the uh, absorption from the different uh, molecules that are in the atmosphere. But that's an, that's an important result that shows that the black body radiation where you have a perfect absorptivity is actually a pretty good uh, model for everything. So there is one thing that's, that's, uh, that's actually interesting to, to note as well. Um, you could actually use a non-quantum mechanical uh, description for this. And I I'm not gonna go and describe it, but 
th there is actually a non-quantum mechanical description, which is called the Rayleigh genes. And the Rayleigh genes describe this uh, internal energy, um, if you will, uh, classically. And what happens is if you, we, let's focus, let's focus just on the left when we have, uh, where we just have a, de a dependent on, on frequencies, okay? Uh, this is the same story for the for the wavelength, but let's let's focus on the left hand side. Uh, we can th this is the Rayleigh genes law here, which we can see uh, it's a law that that's the limiting uh, case of um, of of what we've just done in detail for the black body uh, uh, radiation that depends on quantum mechanics. This Rayleigh genes classical actually fits exactly what we obtained for the black body radiation at very low frequencies. And in fact, in a log lock, uh, in a log lock plot like this, uh, you expect these plots to just show a straight lines. And they do. For low frequency, those plots show as uh, straight lines. And these are the, the, dot li the, the dotted lines on this side. And if I can the dot line on the right hand side. Uh, and by the way, there is a mistake uh, in the figure in the book, I believe. Uh, I let you. I let you figure out if I if it's correct or not. What I write here, uh, uh, I I replace this label. Um, the point remains, though, is that the fit is perfect at the low frequency and long wavelengths, but it's not at high frequency. In fact, the Rayleigh genes, the classical model, expect uh, that you you have a kind of an a, you keep increasing the energy density as you increase the frequency. So increasing the frequency means that you increase the energy of individual photons. And what this, this predicts, the Rayleigh Gene's law predicts, is that the higher the frequency, the more energy you can store. And that was a big issue because in history of, of physics, it's an important result because it's one of the reasons showing the classical physics did not work. Uh, and in fact, uh, and re required a correction. And this is, this is one of the early... Uh, example of why uh, uh, quantum mechanics was, was needed. And in fact, you can see it here. So just to show it again to you, this is the Rayleigh genes result on the da dashed line. Not too bad, not too bad description for long wavelengths. Um, um, so short frequencies, but terrible for low wavelengths, so high frequencies. And that means simply that if you look at the spectrum, uh, things are okay for large enough wavelengths, like, like in this area, but bad in the violet and ultraviolet. And in fact, it was called the ultraviolet catastrophe from the Rayleigh genes. So this catastrophe is the fact that Rayleigh genes predicts, a classical physics predicts an explosion in energy, even though quantum mechanically it's not the case. And the reason why you have this is because at high frequencies, Okay, in the infrared, uh, in the ultraviolet, sorry, infrared is, is in this area, which is lower energy. Uh, the higher energies are ultraviolet, uh, so short wavelength. Uh, the frequency H bar omega, which is basically the, the energy you need to excite those states, uh, is very high and it's so large that it's become more and more difficult to excite those states because uh, remember the Boltzmann factor, right? The Boltzmann factor tells you that it's the population of a state goes down exponentially when its energy increases. And the fact that uh, we had to ascribe a specific energy for the photons, H bar omega, is a, is a quantum mechanical effect. And the, if you take that into account, as we did in the full description of this process, um, you find that indeed uh, it's it's less you can store less and less energy because you just can't have access to those state, to those levels and instead of keeping increasing forever it start, start to go down and in fact at very 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 tiny wavelengths so very very high frequency you can't excite anything anymore like in the X-ray and all that stuff so you can't excite anymore and there if you can't excite them you have a zero population and therefore the internal energy that you that you correspond to that so the spectral uh, energy that you you uh, spectral energy density sorry that you have for those frequencies get becomes zero so that's a quantum mechanical effect so we can discuss a little bit uh, uh, now about uh, the, the radiance 
uh, which is the surface brightness. And I, I just like to say a couple of words on, on this. I just don't want to spend a, a crazy amount of time, but just, just to mention it. So if we consider the flux of radiation per steroid irradiant, so just for those who forget, a steroid irradiant is one of those um, solid angle that we that we have in three dimension, and we call the steroid irradiant the, the the short version is the S, is SR for steroid irradiant. So there is four pi steroid irradiant in a sphere, and we can find that the the radiance uh, so for per steroid irradiant, if you will. So the flux per steroid irradiant will be the flux we obtained before. So C times U for a given frequency divided by, divided by the total number of steroid irradiant that I have in in 3D, so 4 pi. And so we obtain this, this equation using using the, the black body radiation uh, law that we found a couple of slides ago. And we can also write this for the wavelength. So this can be useful when you try to solve a problem of radiance of uh, uh, at a given opening in, in three dimension for a given frequency. Uh, another thing that's important here is that if you look at this plot here, for example, this is a plot I already showed before, which is the internal energy as a function of wavelength. If you look at the peaks, uh, like at 300 Kelvin, uh, if you actually increase the temperature to 250, you see the peaks go more and more to the right and 200 to the right. So that was when you look at this. In fact, if you were doing the crunching the numbers, you would see that the the the, the wavelengths at which the maximum occurs times the temperature is actually a constant. So if you multiply the position of the peak times the 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 energy at which the peak has been calculated, you find that this is a constant, uh, and this is called the Wien's law. Uh, that's very interesting, and in fact, it's very easy to prove. If you go back to the full uh, the formula that we find for the spectral energy density, I mean, in terms of, of wavelength, uh, you know that the maximum is going to be obtained by calculating the first derivative of this function. So you calculate the first derivative. This is a pretty straightforward first derivative to calculate. And when you do it, you will find that, uh, that indeed beta divided by lambda is a constant. Beta is one of the KBT. So in other words, 1 over t lambda is a constant, so therefore t lambda max is a constant. So lambda max means it's the frequency at which the derivative is zero. So you can actually prove this pretty straightforwardly now that we have the exact formulation for uh, the spectral energy density that we obtain. Now that's an important result because that means that um, if you can calculate the maximum at which something happens, you can calculate what temperature it corresponds to. So, uh, so what is the body that emitted this uh, uh, radiation, basically? So the first example at room temperature, uh, so at 300 Kelvin, you see that the maximum is about 10 micrometer, which is actually, if you go to if you go to a typical table, this is called an in, this is an infrared. There's a reason why at room temperature the object emit at the infrared. If you remember the picture I showed you of the uh, at the first slide of this lecture. Uh, where you need infrared goggles. This is what we see. This is this is the kind of heat that's radiated at room temperature. Now another example, and it's it's a crucial example which I'm going to spend a couple minutes on. At 2.7 Kelvin, so very tiny temperature, right? An object will radiate about one millimeter. So one millimeter. Uh, that's way to the right here, right? This is 10 to the minus six. So this one is 10 minus five. One millimeter is 10 to minus three. So it's way this way. But there's a small maximum, which is one millimeter. Uh, this is actually called a microwave. Uh, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit confusing. A microwave is not a micron. Uh, it's not 10 to minus six. A microwave is actually about one millimeter, one centimeter. Micro comes from the fact that it's small. Okay. So why is this important? Well, here is the thing here that we have on the right-hand side. These are experimental data. And these experimental data that come from NASA uh, show that, uh, first of all, the experimental data uh, fit with the black body radiation spectrum very, very, very well. Okay, And I'm going to tell you where the experimental data come from in a second. Second, the maximum is about one millimeter, right? These are meters. It's 10 to minus three meters. So it's about one millimeter here. So it's a microwave radiation. Further, if you keep looking, if you look at different area in the sky, 
you see that this radiation is actually pretty uniform. I mean, the scale is not present here, but it's pretty uniform. So it turns out that this is actually the radiation that you obtain by looking at the sky in all directions. And you find that there is a radiation coming from somewhere, which is exactly at about, I mean, it's about one millimeter. It's a, a 2.7 Kelvin. This is, this is what this fit gives. And in fact, this is a result obtained by Penzias and Wilson, and they obtained a Nobel Prize for this. They actually were observing the radiation coming from anywhere in, in, the, op in the open, in the space. And they found that there was, there was a, a background radiation, okay? And that background radiation corresponds to 2.7 Kelvin. And, uh, and fit, uh, the fit for black body radiation was amazingly good. And you can see that in, on this plot here. And it turns out that the radiation uniform isotropic, and this is an indication uh, that the, the, there was a time where the universe was in thermal equilibrium and in fact, it started from, from one object, which was very hot, the, the, the Big Bang model. Uh, and it started and basically it expanded. And the fact that uh, you have, an, uh, the reason why we think that it's, it, this is evidence that it expanded this way from a small object is because the, the radiation is uniform. And uh, of course, it's uniform and it, it has traveled through space. It lost, uh, I mean, it, energy and and of course uh, uh, we also know how the the energy changes with temperature right to 10 to the power four and so we can obtain all, all we can use all that th that information here by going backward in time okay by seeing how much uh, uh, how long it uh, th that radiation was was uh, generated and what temperature it corresponded to so very often you're going to see plot like this, uh, where you have the, um, the temperature. So 2.7 Kelvin is what we measure. And if we go back in time, that temperature corresponds to 10 to the power 32 Kelvin, where all the laws of physics as we know them were basically, uh, uh, I mean, we, they did not manifest themselves. Everything that has to do with electrostatics at this temperature does not matter anymore. Uh, think a little bit with where, where we are now, with the temperature at which we work, we, most of the interaction, the, the um, uh, very, very small energy interaction, just like we discussed in, before in this course, do not matter because the Boltzmann factor in this case uh, is, is essentially uh, uh, one. Uh, so it's, uh, um, you, you can't really differentiate between, between different objects, different effects. So, the, the, as I said, we can run back in time, and uh, I, I invite you to read uh, the, the description, which is a bit longer in the book about this. I'm, I'm here just giving you a summary. Um, the in universe uh, expand, and uh, and uh, that would explain why this expansion corresponds to uh, uh, basically cooling down of of uh, the cooling down to 2.7 Kelvin that that we observe here. Uh, so we can use a, a Stefan Boltzmann law that uh, the radiation falls is t to the power four, and we can also uh, look at the fact that the energy density uh, for an expanding universe also decreases by a factor four. So what we find is that the universe cools as it, as it expands. So we have an expansion of the universe, and the the the, the temperature we see today is two point seven Kelvin, and we can find the initial temperature. We can extra in, extrapolate in the early days of the universe, early second of the universe, the temperature that it would have been to, to generate such a radiation of 2.7 Kelvin so many times after. So uh, yeah, so that's, 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 what, that's what happened. So I have one more topic to cover uh, in, this, in this lecture and this will be it. And this will give you a little bit more insight about what's happening in terms of uh, the excitation of material due to radiation, and this is this is going to be uh, related to the Einstein A and B coefficients, and I'm going to introduce to you what they are, and then calculate them. So, uh, so how do you excite a, a material? So you excite material. Uh, you, you know the electrons have different uh, energy levels. Uh, we've we've studied that in previous lectures and in, in in problems, and so. Those energy levels can be excited, so you excite electrons from different states. And you, you have to realize that all those objects, uh, 
molecules, atoms, and so on and so forth, they they are in the in a bath of photons. So they exist. Uh, if you have, if you put, for example, those atoms in a cavity, like we saw before, there is a radiation field. There's a radiation we calculated. It is, is if you have a finite temperature, you will always have a, a field. There is always an energy density. There is nothing you can do about it. Okay. So the radiation field uh, has a distribution u of omega, and this is what we spent the entire lecture today uh, to describe. So I hope that that you realize it's what you did. Uh, so now the question that we can can since can can ask ourselves is. How does uh, how do the atom actually the, the atoms actually interact with that uh, radiation field? And so this is what we are going to to do now for the next few next few slides. Okay, first of all, let's suppose there is no field. Let's suppose there is no radiation around. And imagine, and we are going to do, that we are going to use our favorite model. We imagine that we are going to to treat the atoms as two level systems. Okay, so they have two level system. We have a ground state, which is the level one, and we have an excited state, level two. Now imagine there is no field. How can you have radiation coming from this, for example? Well, if you have excited level two for, for one way or another, let's not worry about that just yet, there will be a spontaneous emission of a photon. How does that happen? Well, if the distance between the levels is h bar omega, Let's say that if you have an electron that's that's excited here and it's that's like it falls down to level one, okay, you are going to create a photon of, of, of frequency h bar omega. Okay. Now you can ask yourself, uh, and I'm going to explain those numbers in a second, you can ask yourself what's the rate of this happening? Well, the number we can calculate the number of atoms that are in level two, uh, like this. So first of all, and I'm going to explain this equation, the change in number of atoms in level two, so N2 is the number of atoms level two, the change with time in the number of atoms is going to be proportional to the number of atoms. So basically, a number of, of atoms that are excited in state two. So in other words, the more atoms are excited into a level two being occupied, the more, the larger that number, the larger the change can be. Okay, that's it. And so, of course, the change is negative. If it's a large number, it's gonna the charge, the change is gonna be negative, right? If it's a large positive number, the change is is negative. It goes down. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we don't we know it's proportional. We don't know the the the, the, the coefficient of proportionality, so we are going to call it a to one. And A to one is essentially uh, going from two to one like this. Okay, so that's that's the idea. Of course, the advantage of this equation is that it's very easy to solve. Uh, you just have to look for a function f two, n two. That when you take its first derivative, you get the same function. Well, looks like an exponential. So in fact, it's what you have. You have an exponential. Where we have rewritten A to one into one over tau, which is the radiative lifetime. So this is basically the time it takes. Tau is the time it takes for the population and two to decay by a factor e. All right, this is always the same idea uh, uh, here. Okay, very nice. So this is the first case where we don't have a field, where we have some excitation of the two-level system, and they are going to radiate this way. Okay, they're going to decay. Nice. Suppose now that you turn on the field. In other words, you have a radiation. You have some energy u of omega that's available to the atoms to be excited. So imagine again there is a, the level separated by h bar omega. The first thing that could happen is that imagine that we only have we have our uh, uh, system that's only occupied level one. They can absorb uh, energy h bar omega from the radiation field. And so that, for example, an electron will be excited from the level one to the level two. Okay, so that's going to be an absorption. Now, the rate at which this happens will depend on how many particles I have on level one, of course. If I have zero particle on level one, none of them will be excited. Okay, 
if I have many of them, it's more likely they will be excited. So that's going to be dependent on N1. Of course, it will also depend on the amount of, of energy available at that frequency. Remember, I need to have distance between the level of h bar omega. If I don't have any energy available in, in the uh, radiation field at that frequency, this is not going to happen either. So clearly, this is the, the rate is going to depend on the energy density at that frequency. And we, only, we could only give a proportionality statement. So in, as always in physics, uh, we, we will be able to use an equality by introducing a coefficient of proportionality B12, which will need to be described later. Okay, so as I said, it, this rate increases energy density and population of level one. So this is called absorption. Now, of course, once the the the, the uh, there is an absorption and there are particles that are excited to level two, they can also going downhill. Okay, the, which is the reverse effect. And the reverse effect, which is called stimulated emission, uh, and it's of course stimulated because we have excited uh, this level here is going to uh, be related to um, uh, particle moving from here down here and releasing a, phot a, a photon, in other words, emitting a photon. And again, the rate is going to depend on how many excited states we have, N2, and also how, what's the density of energy. So where can I store the energy H bar omega from this photon in the radiation field? So that's going to be here. And again, we have another constant of proportionality, in this case, B2, 1, because we go from 2 to 1, and here we got from 1 to 2. And uh, this is what we obtain from the emission. Okay. So one thing that's important is that in order for this to happen, we need two photons. First, a photon that excites, and second, a photon that's released. So this is, this is, uh, 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 this is this is the reality here. So we have three coefficients. We have A21, which is for the spontaneous emission, B12, which is for absorption, and uh, B21, this is a typo here, it's B21, uh, for, uh, for the stimulated emission. And we call those uh, three factors the Einstein A and B coefficients. Okay. These are this is the summary of what we have so far. Uh, the three cases that we have so far. So imagine uh, this is going to happen no matter what. There is this decay no matter what, field or no field. This is absorption when there is a field and the stimulated emission when there, is, uh, when there is a field as well. Okay, because this is where you store the energies in the field. You, this is because of this. Now at steady state, what comes in is what comes out. Okay, so basically you end up with a steady state that population one, population two becomes constant. So in other words, whatever uh, uh, comes from two to one, which is this effect here and this effect here, whatever falls from two to one has to have come from one to two. So what goes up on the right-hand side has to go down from the left-hand side. This is called a dynamic equilibrium. That does not mean that photons stop to be exchanged and excited. No, it means that we have as many excitation as we have uh, released to the first to the, to the lower level, and we can reorder this to obtain that the energy density, uh, uh, the spectral energy density, can be obtained from these coefficients here. And of course, we don't know what those three coefficients are: two a two one b two one b two. Uh, uh, and um, a B12. We don't know what they are. But what we know is that U of frequency is given by the black body radiation. We spent a lot of time in this lecture to, to find this. And so that means that we have that information. But we also have another piece of information, which is that the population of the state of the level one and two is going to be obtained by the Boltzmann factor. Uh, by each Boltzmann factor and, and the relative uh, occupation of those two states is going to be obtained by, by this equation. And I'd like to uh, actually insist on the fact that here the G2 of the G1 is related to the, degen the degeneracy uh, between uh, the, the two states. Okay, so this is, these are the, the, the typical uh, formula when we have degeneracy that's not equal to, to, uh, uh, to one. 
uh, there is uh, an exercise, uh, I believe it's in uh, uh, 21.4 uh, that's actually, uh, that's going to be uh, helpful for, for, for you to, uh, to understand this better. So you can put all these equations together because now we have, we had five unknowns here, five, six even, but we, then we have, we, are, we have this one and we have this one. So we end up with equations that relate uh, the B, the, you can obtain B21, uh, actually you can obtain A21 from B21 and you can obtain B12 from B21 as well, uh, like this. So these are, this shows that uh, at equilibrium, uh, you can actually obtain uh, two of the coefficients from the knowledge of the third one. Okay, that's, that's what it means simply because we use everything that we've known. Now, the last topic I'd like to discuss is, imagine now that you would like to get more photon produced and absorbed. Imagine that's what you want to do. So you don't want to be in dynamic equilibrium. You want to, uh, you want to produce more photons. So you want, you want this process to, 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 be, to be the primary process, let's say. So you want to really have uh, photons that, that comes out more than that are absorbed. So let's try to see, this is called a gain. So in that case, you have a gain. And of course, that means that uh, you want to have uh, more emission, so more creation of photon that you have absorbing. So that means that you have a net amount of photon coming out. And that means that this process here, which is this one, has to be larger than this process here, okay? So if you, if you work it out, of course, here it's pretty clear, careful, pretty clear that you need to have a larger occupation of state two than larger than occupation of state one. Imagine the two, the, the two uh, uh, degeneracy are the same, for example. Uh, that's called a population inversion. Uh, why is it called a population inversion? It's called a population inversion because it means that there is more uh, electron, let's say, that are at high energy than electron that are low energy. If you follow the Boltzmann distribution, that makes no sense. The lower the energy, the lower energy state that always have a larger Boltzmann factor than the higher energy. There's nothing you can do about this. Um, so, uh, especially, especially in a two level system like this. Okay. But here you want to invert the population of a higher, high energy one. So, so clearly, um, this is a difficult thing to do, but it is doable. And in fact, this is the, this is the principle of the laser. In fact, laser means light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, which is exactly this process here. So in a laser, the idea of a laser is to create this population inversion. And uh, the way it's done is by using multiple states, not just two. If you use two states, you cannot do this. But you are using multiple states where you make sure that you pump a particular state, the second one, while you drain this one. And you, you end up in a situation where, yeah, you have uh, uh, the, the creation of photons. More photons are created than are uh, uh, absorbed. And uh, for example, by, by increasing the occupation of this level compared to this one. And what's very nice is that not only that, there is a, a large amount of photons that are, that are emitted, uh, but on top of that, they're all the same frequency. So they're coherent photons, and this is how the laser uh, works. So one more time, this is all related to the fact that you have this radiation field, U omega, that, that allows this to, to happen. That, says, that was another long screencast. Uh, it's probably not as long as the timing of this, uh, uh, of this screencast may seem. I think I, I spend more time explaining a, in more, a bit more detail than usual. Uh, we've done a lot of work. We've looked, we started to work at the uh, Stefan Boltzmann equation. And when we did a statistical mechanics treatment, we were able to find the, the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Then we studied the black body uh, radiation and we were able to calculate the black body distribu uh, distribution and in particular U of omega, which is the spectral energy density. We found that that spectral energy density can exp is a very, very good um, uh, model to explain the cosmic uh, the background radiation, but also to explain how the the, the sun luminosity can uh, can can take place and it take, does take place. Uh, and finally, we discussed uh, how this is related to the theory of laser, in particular, this balance between emission and absorption of 
uh, photon from the radiation field in a cavity, for example. I hope that uh, you enjoy this lecture and uh, I'll see you for next lecture, which will be on phonons. Thank you.